Good morning. Glad to worship with you uh, on this August 9th. Hope that you and your family are doing well. Uh, you all remain in our hearts and prayers here at Christ Church. We'll do the college for today. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Kings. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophet with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him the word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. I will listen to what the Lord is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in the land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
but how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Again, glad to worship with you today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. In his 2000 book, In the Heart of the Sea, Nathaniel Philbrick recounts uh, the epic tragic voyage of the early 19th century whale ship, the Essex. The captain of the Essex was George Pollard Jr. and the first mate was Owen Chase. And Owen Chase uh, later wrote a memoir about this voyage that became the inspiration uh, for Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And fairly early on in the voyage, uh, the Essex uh, was caught off guard by a wicked, massive storm at sea. And Philbrick describes the storm this way. They could see it coming, a large black cloud rushing toward them from the southwest. It was said that the sharper and more defined the storm cloud, the worse the wind, thunder and lightning were also bad signs when jagged streaks of lightning began to crackle out of the forbidding black sky and thunder boomed. Captain Pollard finally began to issue orders, but it was too late. So what happens is the crew of the Essex tries in vain to turn around away from the storm and they're sideways when the storm hits them full force. And it turns the Essex on its side, literally, for a while, while the storm ravages the boat and the crew hang on for dear life. And finally, the Essex manages to right itself and the sky is clear and the storm has passed, but there's been significant loss. Philbrick continues, the mood aboard the Essex sank into one of gloom. The ship had been severely damaged. Several sails, including both the main top gallant and the studding sail, had been torn into useless tatters. The cookhouse had been destroyed. The two whale boats that had hung off the port side of the ship had been torn away and washed away, along with all their gear. 
the spare boat in the stern had been crushed by the waves. Although the Essex stern could be repaired, they would be without a single spare boat. And the crew managed to repair the stern of the Essex and the voyage continued only to end tragically uh, with an encounter uh, with a huge sperm whale, which you probably guessed. And storms at sea uh, caught even these experienced sailors on the Essex off guard. And it can happen not just with whale ships, uh, but with family boats. In her 1976 novel, Ordinary People, uh, Judith Guest uh, writes about what happened uh, with the Conrad family, uh, or excuse me, the Jarrett family in Chicago. The two sons of the Jarrett family, Buck, the old, strong, athletic one, the older of the two, the mom's favorite, and his younger brother, Conrad. And Buck and Conrad went out on the family boat on Lake Michigan one day just to have some fun and were caught off guard by a storm. And ironically enough, it was Buck, the older, stronger one, the better swimmer, who slipped away and drowned while the younger, weaker Conrad clung for his life. And in the aftermath of this tragedy, um, what happens with the Jarrett family is that Beth, the mom, and Calvin, the dad, they each have their own struggles, and Conrad wrestles with survivor's guilt. Conrad is convinced that it's his fault that his older brother Buck died. And so late in the novel, Conrad calls his therapist, Dr. Berger, in the middle of the night, Dr. Berger agrees to meet Conrad at his office and they talk. Conrad cries out, I can't, I can't get through this. It's all hanging over my head. Dr. Berger asks, what's hanging over your head? Conrad continues, I don't know, I need something, I want something. I want to get off the hook. For what? For killing Buck, don't you know that? For letting him drown. And how did you do that, Dr. Berger asked. I don't know, I know that I did, I just know. But you were on opposite sides of the boat. So you couldn't see each other, right? And he was a better swimmer than you. He was stronger. He had more endurance. Yeah. So what is it that you think you could have done to keep Buck from drowning? Tears flood again in Conrad's eyes. I don't know, something. You don't understand. It has to be somebody's fault. Or what was the whole point of it? The point of it, Dr. Berger says, is that it happened. Now, at some point in your life, maybe today, I hope not, but it might be, you're caught off guard by some massive storm in your life that you just didn't see coming, that turns your life sideways and does a lot of damage, leaves a lot of loss, may leave you feeling guilty and out of control, may leave you feeling like Conrad, I can't, I can't get through this. In today's gospel lesson, the disciples, who were experienced fishermen, uh, no strangers to the sea, uh, were caught off guard by a wicked storm. Matthew tells us this, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up by a mountain, up a mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. The disciples were in the boat and then in the storm uh, because Jesus had asked them to get in the boat and cross the sea. It wasn't even their idea. They were just doing what Jesus said to do. And yet still they found themselves caught off guard in a wicked storm at sea, battered by the waves, far from land the wind against them. And maybe some of them were echoing Conrad and wondering what the point of it was. 
people often ask that in the middle of the hardest times in their life. And the point of this is, and yet Jesus comes right out to them in the midst of the storm and gives them grace. Matthew says, early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea and they were terrified. It's a ghost. They cried out in fear. And immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, be not afraid. Jesus provided grace in the storm. To his disciples, both in his reassuring presence and his reassuring words, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then Jesus gives more grace to an individual disciple, Peter. As you remember, Peter said, if it's really you, Lord, ask me to come walk to you. And Jesus said, come on out. So Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water toward Jesus. But then Peter's attention turns from Jesus to the storm and he begins to sink. And Jesus uh, hears a prayer from Peter. Peter cries out a very succinct prayer, a very gut level prayer, a very to the point prayer. <laughs> Lord, save me. That's all he has time to yell out as he begins to sink in the water. And Jesus uh, doesn't allow Peter to sink for a while so that he really learns his lesson. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and saves him. Oh, you have little faith. Why'd you doubt? I'm right here with you. I got you. And then they both get into the boat and Matthew says the wind ceased. The storm was over. And the disciples, they're on the boat, the worn out, soaking wet, terrified, but now relieved, exhausted disciples worship Jesus. Truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus answered Peter's prayer Lord, save me. And he did. He saved Peter. Jesus gave all the disciples grace in the storm. And again, in the, it was in the aftermath of this storm uh, that the disciples were reminded that Jesus actually had been with them and had saved them, that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Later, Jesus provided grace in the storm, uh, not just for the disciples, but for the whole world on Good Friday. As Jesus found himself in the midst of a storm of violent hate, uh, vehement anger, blasphemous mockery, Jesus was battered not by waves of the sea, but battered by the fists of Roman soldiers and nailed to a cross with not just the wind against him, but the whole world against him. Even Peter, who Jesus had literally saved from drowning, had denied him and was nowhere to be found. And yet Jesus still gave grace to the whole world. Matthew tells us that after Jesus breathed his last on the cross, there was an earthquake, and then those at the foot of the cross echoed what the disciples had said in the boat after the storm. Truly, truly, this is the Son of God. And later, early in the morning, the risen Jesus uh, continued to give grace. And on Easter evening, Jesus uh, went to the disciples uh, who were in a different kind of storm, a storm of grief, guilt, wondering like Conrad, what was the point of all of this? And Jesus met them again. Uh, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Take heart as I, be not afraid. And then just as it happened in today's gospel account, later the risen Jesus gave the individual Peter <laughs> grace in the midst of the storm in his heart, his raging storm of grief and guilt for denying Jesus at his darkest hour. And Jesus gave Peter grace in that storm, fully forgave him, fully restored him in the presence of his peers. Maybe today in your life, uh, what Conrad experienced is what you're feeling. I can't get through this. I can't do this. I don't see the point of what's going on. 
And Jesus' words uh, to his disciples on the sea or Jesus' words to you today, take heart, it is I, be not afraid. And although in the aftermath of the storms in your life, you may wonder what the point was, remember the gospel. Remember the gospel of God's grace, God's unconditional love for you, demonstrated definitively and historically in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Remember the gospel. The point of it is that it happened. When it comes to your relationship with God, you have nothing hanging over your head. You are off the hook. And rest assured, when you echo Peter's prayer, Lord, save me, Jesus will, because Jesus always gives grace in the storm. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.